Mesdames et Messieurs les Présidentes et Présidents de Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, chairpersons of committees, national and European members of parliament, dear colleagues, it's an honor for me on behalf of the Speaker of the National Assembly, Mr. Richard Ferrand, to welcome you to this first theme-related interparliamentary session organized as under the French presidency of the Council of the European Union. It's an honor also because <clears throat> for the, a period of six months, Europe <clears throat> will be at the center of our national debates. We, as MPs, are the uh, go-between uh, between our representative assemblies and citizens, and therefore it's very important for us to think about uh, major risks just as Europe is at the forefront of international developments. We would like, before we begin, to express our full solidarity with the Ukrainian people, with our friends from Eastern Europe. We also feel that some very painful memories are being awakened. We condemn and unanimously uh, condemn the military pressure imposed by Russia. France stands by Ukraine and its population. We will continue to provide civil and military support. We have unshakable bonds with the young European population that go far beyond association agreements. And therefore, the European Union, for the first time, will facilitate the delivery of lethal weapons by unlocking 450 million euros for military assistance to Ukraine, which includes cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a special focus. We know that conflicts have become hybrid in nature, and the war in Ukraine will show this. We must raise awareness among stakeholders and in businesses of all kinds who need to raise their level of protection against this sort of threat. Very often, companies that are the target of cyber threats do not speak up because they are ashamed, but these are vulnerabilities that need to be addressed, and it is only together that collectively we will be able to overcome crises of this kind. We come out the stronger, I believe, during crises, and the present crisis makes no exception. We are facing very strong uh, headwinds, and we need to protect our citizens. We are in a harsh and unstable world, and as a response, we need to we need Europe to be uh, strong. We need Europe to be united as the geopolitical arena is being reshuffled. As members of European and national parliaments, we have a very important role to play. We also need to show mutual support and support towards the Ukrainian resistance. Uh, the past urgent developments uh, uh, show that there is no other solution than to be credible players. We need to be strong. We need to become reliable, predictable and uh, not only fair weather of uh, friends. We need to support this by a clear and realistic uh, vision. And in doing so, Europe is making uh, big strides forward in terms of uh, uh, common Euro security and defense. We need to mobilize to counter uh, these developments. Europe as a strategic alliance is also a Europe that is looking far down the road and preparing for its future. We are the second largest economic power. We owe to our citizens, to our children, to effect the climate and digital transitions. I would also like to underscore that Europe will prosper only if it can really address the difficulties as well as the concerns and hopes of its citizens. The French National Assembly also wishes to make a contribution to strengthening the bonds that need to be strengthened between citizens and institutions. That is why we also decided to organize regional thematic debates on these same 
topics. The topics that we're here to discuss today have a direct uh, relationship with those areas of concern for our citizens. And I would like to share my conviction that it is by talking about uh, sometimes difficult issues with our fellow citizens, such as climate change, uh, such as uh, sustainable tourism, uh, that we will, I hope, be able to achieve what we are all looking for, to establish Europe durably in the mindscape of our fellow citizens and voicing and upholding these uh, priorities is, uh, I think, a testament to our desire for more unity. I think that it can help us really identify the strengths and weaknesses of our uh, common future. Now, we were scheduled to organize uh, this meeting in Toulouse, the uh, space capital of Europe, for obvious reasons. But we hope to be able to welcome you on March 20th and 21st in the Val de Loire region to talk about other important issues, the CAP, uh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable uh, food business practices, and so on. The themes, topic for, uh, the themes selected for our conference today, I think, will form the pillars of the uh, economy of the 21st century. First of all, there is the uh, aspect of culture. We need to look at the future with eyes wide open. We can only exist if we can uh, project uh, our culture, if we can share uh, our uh, dreams in our own language, in our own uh, conceptions. That is what is called soft power, uh, which is very important to governments today. And we are at a crossroads today. In Europe, we have for a long time had very high quality uh, cultural industries with a good reputation, but the pandemic took a hard hit with the loss of one-third of revenue in this industry at the same time as uh, America was strengthening its hegemony over this sector. The uh, pandemic has completely upset and overturned the ways that cultural products are designed, produced, disseminated. And Amazon and Netflix should not be allowed to uh, prosper, although uh, they do wield the same power as the big agribusiness groups that mm, impose their, uh, that dictate how a food is produced and how much farmers get paid for it. We must also address the very obscure tax uh, systems and subsidy systems for those that want to produce cultural um, uh, goods in Europe. We, the level of autonomy, uh, the uh, level of cultural creation in Europe are uh, huge assets. And I know that many uh, stakeholders in the cultural sectors in Europe are um, being very creative in terms of solutions. And I'm very happy to see the National Assembly having placed cultural production as one of our priority topics. Another very important condition to exist in tomorrow's economy and another duty in Europe as a strategist organization is the space industry. The scope of applications, the, uh, the scope of opportunity in the space industry is broadening every day, covers everyday activities. I'm thinking of energy management, uh, the monitoring of climate uh, uh, change, the development of new modes of transportation with uh, the global positioning systems, uh, navigation systems, the exponential um, development of uh, uh, IoT applications. So this sector is opening up huge opportunities and is attracting uh, players uh, that are huge in 2020. He launched uh, close to 2,000 satellites as part of its Starlink project. <clears throat> now, there are huge private actors, but we must uh, preserve our industrial capacity and allow it to take its, uh, play its full role in the space industry. Our debate will probably address this. Uh, I think that we need to remain attentive and make sure that we support European players by uh, helping them, for example, by applying a carbon tax at our uh, borders, uh, being more forthwith in supporting them and setting up an efficient support system for our startups. Uh, 
we should not make the mistake of providing support to only uh, a select number of stakeholders, because sometimes we need exceptional creativity and exceptional boldness to make big leaps forward. There are other, there are also new conflicts uh, emerging. We see that there is a developing arms race. We have seen anti-satellite launches recently. There's the development of military satellites. So space is a more and more occupied space. We need to deploy our forces, but do so together, because these challenges are huge, and we cannot contend with them alone. Europe has always risen to these challenges. For example, Galileo, we are now strategically independent in terms of global positioning systems. Uh, there's also the example of Copernicus, which gives us huge digital capabilities in terms of collecting data about climate change. There's also the Connectivity Constellation project that will be addressed by Thierry Breton later on. <clears throat> this should provide us with a secure communication and surveillance system uh, whereby uh, we can protect our assets in space. And just like for culture, we need a common European a strategy that will put all of its forces into uh, driving the uh, space-related industrial revolution. The challenges are huge. Now, there's a very quick comparison that can be made. Uh, 6.5 billion euros put into the space program by the European uh, uh, Union and the $65 billion on the other side that the U.S. instills in the industry. So there are a lot of topical issues on the agenda, and we certainly look forward to be able to debate this with you. Jean-Michel Bourlange, who's uh, the uh, chair of our uh, External Affairs uh, Committee, we are like in the second phase of a marriage when uh, you start a family. You no longer look at each other, but you look together down the road at the future, at what the future holds for you. I look forward to this debate. I know that you will be putting a lot of uh, f very imaginative, creative ideas on the table. It is via this joint debate, by listening to each other, by learning for the, each other, that we can make Europe uh, move forward and uh, that we can better serve our citizens. Thank you. I'm happy to hand over now to Mr. Bruno Studer, who chairs the Culture and Education Committee at the Assembly, at the National Assembly, and he is speaking from Strasbourg. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Within the European Union, as on the international arena, France has for a long time defended the, an extraordinary status to be afforded to cultural uh, creation. The cultural market is different from others, and it uh, deserves being protected and deserves special support measures in order to better embody this unity in diversity European principle. I'm very glad that the French presidency of the European Union has devoted one of its important conferences on the future of the cultural industry in a digital world. The European Union is a very important framework for the development of a, a continental scale European uh, cultural industry that also uh, has, addresses the global market. We have very rich sectors in the audiovisual uh, production, uh, cinema, uh, live entertainment. Uh, all need new production and are all affected. by new consumption models, they can be a threat to more traditional consumption models. And this has, uh, this has been especially felt since the advent of the pandemic. We need to protect authors and their intrinsic rights. Uh, and in order to achieve this, the European Union needs to provide innovative, responsive, effective responses to uh, international platforms, so we need an original legal framework and uh, special economic measures when necessary. 
over and above the support measures uh, that the European Stimulus Plan provides, there have been a number of initiatives in the European Union over the past few years that uh, uh, should help us to uh, address these challenges. There are two systems that are presently being incorporated into the laws of our different uh, states. One is on the audiovisual services uh, directive, a minimum quota of 30 percent European content in the catalog of uh, VOD operators. Also, a measure to fight against hate speech and uh, 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 in social networks. And then there's also a package to protect uh, authors' rights, copyright on digital platforms uh, for a better redistribution of uh, uh, rights, and also the creation of neighboring rights for uh, content uh, 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 publishers and uh, press agencies. There's a regulation that's under scrutiny on the digital services and on digital markets. All of this together should uh, level the playing field amongst all players and uh, should uh, make international platforms more responsible and accountable in terms of content provided. Some of the uh, some new legal measures were adopted in uh, France, and the National uh, Assembly has always um, afforded a lot of importance to the protection of uh, uh, cultural industries across Europe. So my uh, committee has been interviewing many stakeholders in the creative industries <coughs> and has taken a number of specific measures. For example, the how our remote controls are configured and how the welcome screens of some audiovisual services are configured. We need to continue working amongst parliamentarians of all European Union countries, and we have a number of experts uh, that will speak to this topic today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here with us this morning, and I'd be Glad to hand over to Ms. Annick Lemaire, who is Vice Chair of the Economic Affairs Committee of the National Assembly. Thank you. Merci. Vice President and Representatives, Senators, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. After the conference organized at the Senate last Friday on the situation in Ukraine, today's meeting at the National Assembly on the future of European cultural business and the space sector might seem to be slightly irrelevant or futile. Nonetheless, we do know that the point of space is not just to light up our imagination. It's also a place where military strategists have been working hard. France in 2019 took over the Inter-Army Command of Space. Star Wars uh, is not just uh, for film screens. This transition shows that uh, the cultural industry plays a vital role in the defense of uh, European values. Aside from American Star Wars, there's also uh, George Melies' Voyage dans la Lune, based on the Jules Verne novel. As Vice Chair of the Economic Affairs Committee, I'm aware of the importance of cultural aspects of our economy and the cultural industries. The creative and cultural industries in Europe are a lever for growth and influence. It's a veritable soft power, which is vital for Europe. It covers a wide range of sectors, visual arts, audiovisual, video games, books, music, and the press. This is a great source of wealth that we must protect and support in a world where we're seeing and will continue to see very significant uh, signs of hege hegemony. We can have a better understanding of the weight of the cultural and creative uh, sector in the economic world. <coughs> Here we're talking about some 4.4% of the GDP of the EU. 7.6 million jobs and a turnover at some 643 billion euros, according to a consultant's report. This activity sector is facing a number of challenges today, and I'll just run through them at this stage. We will have a uh, more in-depth discussion subsequently. 
Culture is the second hardest hit by the health crisis after air transport. Revenue from the cultural and creative sectors in Europe uh, plummeted by vast amounts of money as compared to 2019, a drop of some 31%. So we're facing a convalescent sector, even though different subsectors were affected differently. Being at the spearhead of soft power in Europe, well, that involves uh, different players, different productions, all striving to support European values. We need to have enough uh, public support for this sector, particularly facing the foreign competitors. Innovation is vital. We're seeing a rapid transformation in these sectors, particularly in the digital sphere. The modes of distribution are changing. Uh, the digital offers are just uh, two examples of what we're seeing in the way of changes. So all stakeholders have to be able to adapt very quickly to these changes. Support to innovation in this sector is decisive. If we're to remain at the adequate level in the new areas where cultural practices are emerging, Let's not overlook that in this regard, we are a growth sector for Europe as a whole. We saw a surplus in 2019 in the sector. Let me conclude these introductory statements by acknowledging the choice of this subject matter in our discussions. Culture is a national treasure, that is true. But it has also to be seen and understood uh, at European level as a vector for growth and influence for the entire Union. I'm sure that uh, this will be examined further by the experts. But I'd now like to hand the floor to Catherine Morin de Sailly. Thank you. Dear colleagues, Madam Chairman, I'm delighted to uh, take part in this significant meeting. Until recently, and for six years, I was in charge of uh, culture and communication in the Senate, and I represent my successor and also the Economic Affairs uh, Committee Chair, Sophie Prima, who was uh, invited. Uh, let me acknowledge what uh, Bruno was saying from Strasbourg. We have worked uh, very hard together to serve the interests of cultural interests. Cultural industry, well, that's already been said. That uh, covers all of the companies that uh, provide cultural goods in terms of value and content. We're talking about book, cinema, radio, video games, mass tourism as well. And I, I would say the printed press as well, because this is uh, one of the sectors that's been affected by the emergence of the digital world. The digital world has uh, turned things on their head in throughout this sector. Uh, the way in which people make use of what is available, new media, uh, new formats, new possibilities opening up, but also an upheaval in the economic side of things. The business models have been changed. Questions have been asked about the rules of the game. They've all changed with the emergence of these new players. This creates dependence and increasing competition, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the non-European platforms already referred to by the previous speakers. These platforms are either inevitable intermediaries if you want to have access to works or direct competitors. I'm thinking about the significant developments in the last few months that we've seen on program platforms. Uh, they've been boosted by the health crisis and the lockdowns. And they are directly competing uh, with against our European industry. As you know, the information society in which we live uh, depends uh, on the EU for its legislation. So this meeting is most welcome so that we can take a look at the possibilities as regards the uh, future of this for Europe. It's a source of wealth. It's a, it's a source of influence. Legislation to date, and this has been referred to by Bruno Frudin just before, has shown that we're capable in Europe 
of um, doing what we have to do to defend uh, culture. But culture is not just a commodity like any other. It has to be dealt with in a specific fashion. And I'm delighted that it's been possible to produce texts such as the uh, AVMSD, which allows for quotas for French language uh, productions or European productions. I welcome the adoption of the uh, copyright directive. And I can tell you that uh, the Senate has tabled a bill which imposes significant uh, requirements and, and to a certain extent anticipates the European legislation. And there are other texts that are currently being discussed, the Digital Market Act and the Digital Services Act as well, DMA and DSA. And these are significant texts. And after so many years, they're opening up the debate once again. If we go back in time to when uh, the first uh, legislative measures were adopted, it was just the start of uh, Facebook and uh, the questions of urgency now in order to revisit the directives and to propose new texts for the regulation. Uh, cultural industry uh, cannot be ambivalent vis-a-vis -vis digital because we're talking here about a source of development and opening up of possibilities, new creations. At the same time, it constitutes a danger for the freedom of creation and uh, the respect of copyright. So it's really important that we continue to work together to build a real digital strategy for creative and cultural industries in a context, as I've already said, where uh, the health crisis has accelerated the digital world, uh, weakening our traditional creators and sources of creation that weren't adequately prepared. Uh, digital and new technologies have, above all, to be growth factors that will make it possible to boost uh, the cultural offering to the public. And this from the point of view of diversity. Cultural rights are at the very heart of the different texts. They're, they're enshrined in French law, and we have to make sure that there is universal access that's guaranteed. I'd also like to stress that it, it might be a lever for transformation and modernization, including in the audiovisual sector. All digital is not necessarily what we want to see. It might seem to be paradoxical for me to say that today, but I'd also like to stress that there are inequalities of access to the digital, which is, means inequality of access to culture uh, until you have full coverage throughout your territory. There are a number of risks of people being excluded and people who won't have use and access. If we take a look at the way in which platforms are leading us, we see that there are problems as regards to connection and constant connection. I mean, if, if there has to be constant connection, then an awful lot of people will be left by the wayside. Europe is men and women. It's a human project, a human-based project. So human beings have to be at the very center of digital transformation. Culture should not be connected. It should be shared, dear colleagues. And I think that it's in this way that we have to take a look at our strategy and our legislation uh, so that uh, once again we can define a more effective and fairer context to support uh, the creative and cultural industries. Large American digital companies are playing a vital role in defining the cultural offering today available to the public. So we have to take very close look at the sharing of the value chain. We have to make sure that uh, the funding modes remain stable for our creations. The rules of the game have to evolve. They have to evolve at national level. We can take certain initiatives there that can be a source of inspiration for other states in Europe. Let me give you a few examples. The Laure Barco's bill to boost publishing. This came out a few months ago with the minimum delivery costs for uh, online ordering of books so as to improve the situation as regards competition between uh, high street bookstores and uh, Amazon. Now, 
we know that there has to be a coordinated response to all of these difficulties if we're to guarantee effective measures. Before concluding, let me refer to the discussions underway for the adoption of the European Directive on the Digital Services, the DSA. The DMA is on the right track. Most of the proposals for improvement have been uh, dealt with by the national parliaments, and that includes the Senate as well, and, and uh, I had the honour uh, to be involved in the work on this text. Anyhow, uh, these proposals have been taken on board so that we can create a fairer market with fairer competition in the interests of all of our companies and also consumers. The GSA is somewhat trickier. We can see that the dividing line between a regulation that might also jeopardize freedom of expression uh, is something that has to be navigated with care. If this text uh, makes it possible to set a framework as regards the omnipotence of these non-European platforms, at the same time, it's just a framework. The specific economic model of these uh, platforms with targeted uh, advertising and opaque uh, algorithms nonetheless continues to weaken the ecosystem. So we have to impose certain demands and requirements as regards the DSA. We have to know what's happening in these black boxes. There have to be regular audits by independent uh, bodies in order to protect everybody against the risks. Uh, and at the uh, National Assembly in the Senate, uh, we heard uh, that uh, the platforms are interested in their own profits and benefits before taking a look at uh, general concerns of security. So we have to increase our demands on these platforms. There is the content produced by our cultural industry that is available on them, but they've actually become public spaces. We can't have a situation where they maintain secrecy and an opaque approach. That's not acceptable. Our legislation, once it's passed, is in force for several years. We can't come back and open the door again uh, for several years, so we have to create the best measures possible so as to move forward in a harmonious, equitable, fair world where cultural diversity will, of course, be guaranteed. If we don't do that, if we don't make that progress, then there's a risk of uh, an over anglo saxonization of our cultural offering, and obviously we're very concerned about that. I think the discussions we're going to be having today are very important. It'll be really vital to hear all of the participants in the sector. They are the first to be concerned. I'm sure that they've got a lot to share with us and a number of proposals to make. Thank you. Merci à vous, chers collègues, pour ces propos très éclairants. Je vous propose... Thank you. We have... Roselyn Bachelot, Minister of Culture, who has been uh, prevented from attending because there's a meeting, so it's been recorded. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be able to introduce uh, this conference of the Presidents of uh, Commissions of the Parliaments of the 27 Member States in the European Parliament on uh, Digital Activities in Space. The first session is devoted to European cultural institutions. Before dealing with this, I would ask us all to spare a thought for Ukraine, its artists, its creators, its journalists, and all those working in culture. Culture is the pillar of a nation and dialogue between peoples. This session deals with the importance of cultural and creative industries in facing the challenges of the digital world. From the architect, from architecture to books, from the cinema to television, audiovisual, press, video games, uh, entertainment, we see that in all of these areas, we're talking about a highly diversified and vast domain. 
All of these sectors are not only facing the health crisis, but also considerable joint challenges linked to the emergence of uh, global platforms uh, that are trying to take over the world, but also a digital and ecological transition. There's a change in use, increased competition of the international players. There are risks for our strategic cultural assets. Modes of creation are being turned on their heads, as are production and broadcasting. They reflect shared problems, shared by cultural and creative industries, and it's an invitation to work together to develop uh, cross-cutting actions. In France, we've been working on a means of structuring them through the 2019 Creative and Cultural Industries uh, Conference in agreement around the need to find a common response in order to overcome the difficulties and obstacles that I identified. It was then possible to develop a strategy at national level to accelerate innovation in cultural and creative industries, and this is being rolled out today through the gradual implementation of some 30 measures to support cultural stakeholders. This strategy is now being reflected in France 2030 and it's based on exceptional resources. With one billion euros in total, it's been mobilized. I wanted to take this opportunity under the French presidency of the uh, Council of the European Union to embark upon a European level reflection on competitiveness and attractiveness of our culture and creative industries because uh, these are at the forefront of our lives in cultural terms. They are the pillar on which we can develop a, a common heritage and a common memory, which is vital if European cultural diversity is to be rolled out. From an economic point of view, we're talking about 477 billion euros, which is close on 4% of the value added produced in the Union, for some 8 million jobs and 1.2 million companies. Culture and creative industries are a major element of our European economy. These industries, what is more, have been identified as one of the 14 key ecosystems in the European approach of Thierry Breton. We're talking here about an opportunity, but in living up to this, we have to come up with new rules adapted to a more competitive, more open economy. We have to find the means of strengthening these industries and maintain a strong cultural and industrial ambition in Europe. Our cultural and creative industries, uh, therefore, must be supported and accompanied, and we have to show tremendous determination all of this. The power and the influence of the non-Europeans here, which has been increased since the start of the health crisis with the development of digital platforms, has shed further light on our objectives. We must uh, protect our European model, and this way we must uh, promote cultural diversity, guarantee the autonomy of our strategic cultural assets. We must uh, preserve and sometimes adapt the methods of production and creation on Euroboil, and also the means of broadcasting and access to cultural content that's guaranteed. Without this uh, strategic autonomy, our cultural practices will slowly but surely move away from works produced in Europe. So I wanted to suggest to my European partners that we would lay down the ground for a real cultural economy, a policy, therefore, through the creation of a European strategy for cultural and creative industries. And this is based on five priorities, improving the access of European creative and cultural sectors to funding, encouraging the growth and development of training and skills acquisition, preserving and reconfirming European cultural sovereignty in the digital era, boosting the export of uh, European cultural companies, promoting responsible cultural 
businesses and accelerating ecological transition thereof. This cross-cutting strategy is currently the subject of discussion within the Council of the European Union and uh, at the Council of Ministers, the Council uh, for, for Culture, which I'll be chairing uh, uh, in Luxembourg, that will be the culminating point. This is highly promising for all of our sectors here. This is highly significant, it's highly important, and I hope that if we approach things in this way, we'll be able collectively to organize and uh, guarantee our cultural sovereignty in Europe. So I'm counting on the discussions that you'll be having today, which will be fed into our discussions that I will be continuing with uh, my European partners very shortly. I wish you all the best in the course of this meeting, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>
the Music Moves Europe initiative, which has earmarked support for uh, ongoing recovery of the European system. At the same time, Horizon Europe, the program in the EU for research innovation, sets aside two and a half billion euros for heritage research and new programs in our creative sectors. I would also like to mention the European Recovery Plan and Resilience Plan, in the context of which many member states have decided to set aside certain investments for culture. This is the case for France and 15 other countries for a combined total that represents, in Europe, something like 2% of the total investments made. Some of these investments will go to the environmental and digital transition of the creative sector. Others will concern meeting more ongoing challenges which have been worsened by the pandemic, such as the precarious status of artistic professions, skills, and accessibility. Don't forget the great support that has already been mobilized for culture through the structural funds with different ways and means of acting in the program of support REAC EU for recovery in Europe and resilience in Europe. So you see that we're at a crossroads of different European policies, and we get funding from different sources for that reason. This also means greater support for culture, but it can also be difficult to manage for small organizations. This is why we launched an interactive guide, which is called Culture EU, and this is a tool which is easy to use. It was created to facilitate access to the sector and European subsidies. It gives many different possibilities of funding to the European cultural sector. Ladies and gentlemen, financial support is one thing, but we also need to think things out and support the sector as it recovers and ongoingly recasts itself. There have been many changes in recent years. Culture professionals have been obliged to adapt themselves and find new ways of reaching their audience, especially thanks to digital manners. And we are supporting them in different ways, facilitating the acquisition of necessary digital skills, but also by creating digital spaces and sharing data. Some legislative reforms, which are crucial for culture and the creative sector in the EU, have occurred in the context of our central project, which is attempting to create a single European digital market. We have also managed to modernize European rules concerning uh, copyright and performance rights, and we will be the Commission already published orientations on the rules for use of protected content on uh, online sharing platforms. This will contribute to stimulating the licensing market for creators. And it is particularly important that member states transpose and apply these new rules. This will allow cultural players to and creative persons to be able to strike a better balance and have greater transparency in the remuneration of for the use of their creative works. We now need to ensure that all these measures be effective and that the advantage really be felt on the ground. New laws for further regulation of digital services presently being negotiated between the co-legislators of the European Union should create a fair digital environment for the culture and creative sector and the people who work therein, allowing them to take full opportunity of the possibilities which digital matters provide. So this can, in the long term, have great impact on the way in which cultural goods are created, managed, broadcasted, made accessible, and monetized, and we need to be ready to deal with this. We should also support our creative industries so as to help them meet the challenges which come from massive investments in content that have been made by a certain number of international players in this context. European creators and producers vis-a-vis -vis international platforms and their situation should give us rise to think. We are talking not just about the economic impact, but also the autonomy of European cultural sector. That's why the Commission will be very attentive to these matters in the context of its report on the outlook for European media. I should conclude by saying we fully share your ambitions for European culture. The culture sector 
as it recovers will have to transform and adjust, but it will be stronger and more resilient as a result of this. And our, we who are defending it in the European Union will be ever prouder of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Roman. I should remind you that because of an unanticipated difficulty, Ms. Hoffman is going to have to leave us at the end of her remarks. And we will obviously send along the questions to the Commission concerning them, which will be answered in writing. Now let me give the floor to Luc Bisson, who is a director, producer, head of uh, CEO in Europecom, and he will be supporting, talking about the difficulties that we have in cultural production in this context and large-scale cultural distribution that we have on hegemonic American platforms. Let me welcome in particular, because I think it's either very early or very late, in Los Angeles, depending on how you count the hours, we're very pleased to have you with us and that you made these efforts to be able to speak with us. I will give you the floor for roughly 10 minutes. Mr. Bissell. Can you hear me? The interpreters do not hear the speaker very well. And now, not at all. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I am extremely flattered to be with you today. And I should like to go quickly. We're asked, really, what is culture for? We all agree that culture defines our Entities are way of being, our way of thinking, and it's an essential reason to defend it. That's why practically all European countries have a Ministry of Culture, but not the United States, which has a union, the MPA, the Motion Picture Association of America. Why is that? Because culture is, above all for them, a major economic vehicle. What Europe is doing in terms of we have 9 billion in turnover. The United States has 26 in the same field. Nonetheless, European culture is an enormous treasure, much greater than in other parts of the world. We have centuries of history, of painting, literature, music, and excellent training with very high-level schools that produce some of the best technicians in the world. And nonetheless, American culture tends to be hegemonic and smother all others. When we have exports of one billion in one direction, we have 18 billion going in the other direction between Europe and the United States. Why is there such a big gap? Because when we have such great wealth, because we defend culture and Americans are selling it and they have no scruples in doing so. They've understood for a long time that culture is the cheapest way to promote a country. And that's the simple truth. If you want to have an advertising campaign at international level to promote a country, that would probably cost billions. Whereas, if we take the example of France, six tourists out of 10 who have visited Paris in the last years have done so thanks to a film or another cultural product. So the indirect benefits of such a cultural policy are colossal. But while this is happening on, the United States are selling their product at the expense of other cultures. And the more powerful they become, the greater the difference will be in terms of films and performances. Last year in the United States, for instance, they produced f roughly 15 films at a certain budget level, whereas Europe had zero. We absolutely need to change that balance of power. We're not fighting at the same level to defend our cultures, and we need to be. By massively supporting our cultures, we are defending our souls and our property. We're very active in many fields. We can look, for instance, at the automotive sector, others as well. But we have lost the cultural 
battle. Losing a battle doesn't mean losing the war, but we do have to act quickly. And here would be four ways forward that we might explore to my way of thinking, as quickly as possible. The problem is platforms. The Americans totally dominate this market and are drying out our cultures and our diversity. I know that Europe is working on this, is passing laws, is trying to strike a balance, and that's a necessary and primordial task. I know that a lot of effort is being made here. But creation goes faster than that, and it's not enough. And while we're thinking about things and legislating, the gap is getting ever greater. Every day they get stronger. I know that for the time being, we're trying to oblige them to produce locally. For instance, in France. I don't think that's the right way to do it. The first reason for this is that big budgets will always be in the United States with American actors. And budgets are such that, what well, they don't promote our talent. The products are very average quality, and there's no promotion of artists. But above all, they are selling an Americanized culture, which creates great damage throughout the sector. Excuse me, I'm having a little problem rereading my notes at this somewhat unusual hour of the day. So even if that effectively allows some jobs to be created in France, it's not a good way of proceeding. When they have a monopoly, prices go down. I don't know if you know this, but technicians and SMEs are obliged to be on lists which have been approved by a platform. They are the ones who set the prices and make the rules. And European industry will have to slowly just become a sort of subcontractor for American managers. And to me, that's a cultural disaster. Before, we had ways to fight. We had a strong cinema and other possibilities which don't exist any longer. The only solution is massive investment in a mega platform in Europe. And today, there is no big European platform. They're all American, and this is an enormous danger. We have our knowledge, our know-how. We have means at our disposal. We have the talent to do this as well. And I think that European countries need to agree on making a reserved and preferential platform that isn't there to make or lose money, but is there to promote Europe as a whole and promote its talents, a platform which will be a promotional tool for a single yet diversified Europe. Telecom operators, Orange, uh, Deutsche Telekom, others could also further strengthen this force, helping to create a European platform. This absolutely has to be done, and quickly, because otherwise, I think in less than three years, we'll all be dead. Culturally speaking, of course. I've been sounding this alarm for the last four or five years. And then the, la the other thing besides platforms is studios. In the United States, we've seen that in the next 10 years, 450 uh, cinema uh, sets will be short when you Look at uh, some studios, they are fully reserved for the next four or five years. The thing, the advantage of studios is they can't be delocalized. The work is done on site. So 450 sets will be created in the next years. I don't know if we're going to miss this train or if we can create two or 300 in Europe, which will let people make films in Europe. I think that's very important. The third point is harmonizing aid. We still have differences in Europe between France, Belgium, the Czech Republic, 
there are lots of countries with different policies. I think it would be very important to have a joint approach. Leasebacks or reductions up to 35 percent for all of Europe. Because France, for instance, makes 200 films, but there are 80 of these that go to Belgium or the Czech Republic or other European countries. We can't compete among ourselves. The true competition is with Canada, Mexico, Australia, some Middle Eastern countries, and partially China as well, which is starting to develop. That's the market we need to get back. And if we have sudden leaseback arrangements, that's what we need to be concentrating on. We need to harmonize in any case so that Europe has a complete offer to make and be able to attract all of those films, which are mostly American, to the European continent. Canada, for instance, has developed amazingly in recent years. I think that a third or even half of American films are made there, and that's a total loss for us. We have the competence. We have the technical people. We should be able to have those films made in Europe. And then inside of that, we also have a look at the administrative side. Sometimes the administrative and the creative sides don't get on. There's more and more administrative content in films. We see that the percentage of people working on a film who are administrators are 20 percent more, which means 20 percent less on the creative side. We have to make efforts with scripts, with training of actors and directors. We need to have a bit more time and concentrate more on creativity, creation of films, the quality of films, and not on administration. So I know that people are thinking about this seriously and with lots of goodwill. But if you have a look at a French film and you look at the European points you get from having this American actor, which makes you lose three points, it just becomes a giant puzzle, which is anti-creative to my way of thinking. And I think we need to be less administrative and think more about creators who are often people whose heads are in the clouds and don't necessarily have the time or the ability to deal with these matters. And then one last point, which is the place or the role of young people, where I find the situation to be truly catastrophic. Our young people in our poorer urban areas, we have all sorts of very talented people who are potentially there, but where we have structures for film distribution which are dominated by much older people, and they just won't cede any space to young people. When you see people, young talents, who in five or ten years' time, economically speaking, will do their country good, and that's what we need. You simply need to be able to compare with digital affairs and applications. The biggest apps in the last few years have been made by CEOs who, on average, are under 30, with all the applications you might be familiar with, whereas in the cinema sector, Everything is managed by people over 60. So you have an age gap of 30 years here. I don't know exactly how we need to fix this, but we do need to fix this and make space for young people. A European platform, a big one, would allow us to create some of this space to promote films. I think each country's national TV channels as well should open up more to young people who also don't have enough space. That was my fourth point. I think that uh, when we defend culture, we defend our souls, but we also defend our economies, our borders. And so I think that it's extremely important to understand that there's a that things in America on a completely different scale. We uh, are in defense mode, and I think we should certainly switch over to attack mode. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I gave you my uh, – the point of view of someone who uh, who's in the field. Yes, well, we certainly did want to hear 
that perspective on things. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that you shed light on many, many issues. I now would like to hand over to Gilles Fontaine, who is uh, Director of the Market Information Department at the European Audiovisual Observatory. He's going to give us an overview of the situation in Europe and the place of our cultural and in creative industries uh, and their role in maintaining uh, audiovisual services. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting the European Audiovisual Observatory to this conference. It's an organization of the Council of Europe but with the support of 40 uh, member states of the Council of Europe, but also with the support of the European Union. I would just like to give you a a bit of uh, background information on the state of the audiovisual industry in Europe. That's a complex uh, thing to do because uh, things change every day. To give you an example, we monitor the content of VOD catalogs uh, available in Europe. There were 150 that we were monitoring five years ago. Today, that number has risen to 900. So as I was saying, things are in constant flux. There's one thing I would like to highlight at the outset, and it is how overall revenue in the audiovisual sector in Europe has eroded, has declined. Of course, the pandemic has certainly hit movie theaters a lot. 2020, uh, numbers went down significantly. Uh, they went back up, but only slowly in 2021. So that has had a great impact also on distribution and uh, um, on the whole industry. But the crisis really uh, only amplified pre-existing trends. So resources in the audiovisual sector have been stagnating for many years. And if you do not take into account, or if you do take into account inflation, you see that these investments, in fact, have dwindled. There are three main sources of investment uh, and financing, funding for the film industry. First of all, advertising. Advertising on TV uh, is uh, bearing the brunt of competition from the internet, and I'm not, and I'm talking about Google, Facebook, Amazon, and their advertising services. Is if a television has withstood pressure from the internet better than uh, the printed media, uh, a television, however, doesn't believe in that major source of funding anymore. The second is the decline in public funding. Uh, there has been a stagnation in funding over the past few years. But if you take the real situation into account, the source of funding has, in fact, declined. Then there's also uh, subscription-based services, pay, TV, and etc. Uh, pay TV has really declined as uh, platform services like uh, Netflix, video on demand, uh, have uh, developed. So I mentioned video on demand platforms. Of course, they started to develop be before the pandemic hit although the latter really has strengthened them. Now, their development has been spectacular. They have been growing at a rate of about approximately 40 percent per annum. I'd like to give you a little more information on video on demand services, because I think that this offers a useful perspective. VOD accounts today for less than 10 percent in original content investment in France, about 10 percent of high quality uh, television series in France as well. So traditional sources of funding, the traditional funding of production by traditional stakeholders in uh, distribution, uh, that remains the bulk of the source of funding. So the very quick growing success of uh, SVOD services, for, ex for example, subscription-based um, American uh, SVOD services, um, 
So that development has been quick. However, there's also very ab uh, abundant offerings in Europe. Uh, uh, the market share of American ser VOD services is 75% in Europe. They are present everywhere in Europe. But saying nothing about European SVOD uh, platforms would be a mistake. We have via play from Scandinavia, but that has extended beyond Scandinavian borders, IPLA in uh, 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 Poland, UPLA in Finland, uh, Canal Plus or Sky's VOD services. Uh, they have strengths. Uh, they have developed, uh, of course, not as much as American platforms. Now, I think that uh, we are going to see, and we are already seeing, a new generation VOD services free of charge. In particular, television stations here have, I think, an ace up their sleeve which they can play and which gives them an edge over the first generation VOD uh, platform. So uh, that's an overview of the VOD industry. Now I would like to share a bit of information on uh, uh, audiovisual production in Europe. In quantitative terms, production displays impressive numbers, over 200 films produced every year. Now, uh, I speak from the position of the European Audiovisual Observatory, where Europe is, is uh, uh, goes beyond the borders of the EU. That growth was slightly halted during uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, but there has been growth, and mostly in the documentary uh, area. In terms of TV fiction, to give you an order of mad, uh, magnitude, over 1,000 seasons of uh, uh, televised series uh, are being produced, and it, that is growing. So that's on the production side. Now on the consumption side of these audiovisual services, um, uh, figures are lacking. We know that ticket sales, theater ticket sales for European production, uh, well, European productions account for about 25 to 30 percent of uh, ticket sales in movie theaters in Europe every year, but we don't have numbers for uh, the numbers of European films viewed on VOD platforms. Now, um, film circulation, distribution across European borders is pretty good. 40% of tickets uh, sold for European films are tickets sold outside of the country of production and half of that, 20 percent, uh, outside of Europe. Now, these uh, uh, imports concern only a small uh, number of films. Two-thirds of films in European cinemas are non-national films. Forty percent of films on VOD platforms are European non-national films. That doesn't mean that they account for 80 percent of viewings. However, uh, these numbers do show that European films do circulate across all European countries. Nevertheless, there is pressure on the European production industry, and in this I'm I'm referring to the entire production chain, including distribu dis distributors and uh, television channels. Uh, so there's pressure in terms of the funding of works. Also, their, uh, the budget for works has increased, um, owing partly to competition from VOD platforms. At the same time, it is more and more difficult to get funding traditional funding operators are seeing more competition for the same amount of resources. There is another big source of pressure, and that is uh, in the area of copyright and the control of copyright over produced works. There are two big models that oppose each other. Uh, on the one side, you have producer as an executive uh, producer that uh, takes part in creating a work but does not uh, distribute it, and a, a producer-distributor model that take a cut in the uh, or have a stake in the money made by the film down the road. My last, uh, my next point will have to do with the way the audiovisual industry itself is structured, is organized in Europe. Uh, 
European uh, companies are uh, in a race to become the biggest, uh, with Fox being bought up by Disney, for example, or the merger project be between Discovery and Warner Media. So there's a race to the being the biggest. And in this perspective, it's interesting to look at how the audiovisual industry is organized in Europe. Uh, and I'd like to share a few findings with you. Number one, when you look at the main uh, companies that operate in Europe, you see that amongst the 10 leading companies in audiovisual production in Europe, four of them are already American. So we're not just talking about VOD companies. Uh, we're talking about uh, the pay TV operator Sky, there's Disney, Netflix, and Discovery. So you see that as we speak, American companies already are heavyweights on the Euro in the European uh, arena, not just in VOD, but also in regular uh, in the regular television market. Also, if you look at uh, recent developments, you see that amongst the, let's say, the 100 top audiovisual companies in Europe, the weight of public television channels is declining. Now, they still account for a large proportion of the market. One third of the audiovisual market is accounted for by public television stations, publicly funded. But that uh, uh, share is dwindling for the same reasons I mentioned at the beginning, is that they, uh, they, their uh, financial resources are shrinking. Now, that has an impact because they play, they take a large part in the production of uh, works. They are the main sources of funding for uh, televised series in Europe. One third finding or conclusion on the structure of the industry in Europe is that we are seeing the emergence of European production companies. So there is consolidation in the European uh, industry, but more at a production level than distribution level. So we are seeing uh, European companies of a significant size emerge. Some of them are fully independent to their broadcasters. Uh, they are broadcasters or they are independent from broadcasters. They are non-broadcasting production companies. And so these uh, three uh, findings are important, have important important uh, repercussions for two big categories. Number one, public television stations, because they are shielded from concentration phenomena, and independent producers who probably have to rethink the, the role and the place they occupy as the industry around them is uh, becoming more and more highly concentrated. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And to conclude, I'd like to highlight two things. Number one, film and made-for-TV film production are two different industries. Uh, concentration phenomena are different. Film production in Europe is quite a scattered. It receives a lot of public support. In Europe, public funding is the leading source of funding for films, with France being an exception, and uh, made for TV films, which re receive less support and where there is increasing concentration, as I mentioned. And my second concluding comment is this. Uh, in my view, competitiveness amongst the television uh, operators and, 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 and film producers, uh, it's a shared destiny. There is more support to, there needs to be more production support for televised films, but uh, there is also increasing film production by platforms. So it's a tightrope we're walking. It's a delicate balancing act. Uh, production in Europe has to seize the opportunities of video on demand, 
but all the while avoiding further weakening of public funding sources. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be very glad to answer any questions you may have later during the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very clear indeed. We are now going to hear from Mr. Hervé Renier, who heads up the Société Civile des Auteurs Multimédia, the SCAM, and he's co-founder of uh, France Creative, and he knows a lot about uh, uh, the reshuffle in the industry, but he also knows that with determination, uh, patience, uh, there are great opportunities to be seized. So you have the floor for about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Bruno. I am a little tired of video conferencing, so I'm very glad to be here in the room with us. It seems to be an opportunity um, rather uh, than an imposition. I'm very glad to be here in person. I would like to uh, offer my heartfelt thanks for the invitation that was extended uh, to me to speak this morning. And I will speak uh, uh, more as the a co-founder of France Creative rather than as uh, director of the Société Civile des Auteurs Multimédia. Um, it's always uh, difficult to come after other speakers. So I'm going to have to uh, adjust some of the things um, uh, that I was going to say. I won't say much about operators in the creative industry because a lot of ground was covered. But in France, we have set up uh, quite an original system. It's kind of like a liaison committee that brings together private and public uh, companies, uh, public interest operators, and other legal entities, and private individuals uh, in film, in music, in uh, book printing, in video games production. And so we have a broad perspective over the audiovisual industry. Now, we commissioned a number of studies uh, uh, by Ernst & Young that were also beneficial to European authorities. And these studies revealed something interesting. We always thought that creative industries were kind of went around with their begging bowl and all they were after was public money. However, um, we did not know much about this sector abroad. Now, let's not forget that France sometimes uh, shows the way forward in terms of support to the creative industries, but we know that we also uh, kind of annoy our European neighbors sometimes, and we tend uh, to uh, lecture our uh, colleagues in Europe. So we must avoid uh, that. Now. Creative industries uh, in uh, Europe generate huge revenue, many jobs, and uh, really support the economy. Every euro spent on buying a ticket to a concert generates one euro in economic uh, revenue. So the, uh, any public money we put in the industry uh, supports uh, GDP. I think that's really important because I can remember a Court of Auditors report that uh, presumed to criticize the uh, financial aids from the CNC, particularly in uh, the documentary film sector, questioning the relevance thereof. Uh, if you relate the aid to the viewing figures on television, that was their argumentation. So the Court of Auditors is concerned with that sort of issue. And when that happens, you might uh, start to question the justification for AIDS and um, political risks uh, when it comes to questioning such financial aid. I mean, as some will already know that uh, this is my hobby horse. This is a question of public fund funding, public finances. I, I would be very concerned, uh, concerned in France uh, as to uh, the funding of the public service in France. It's likely to evolve. Uh, I mean, everybody is aware of this. We've got uh, a couple of uh, far-right uh, candidates for the elections who, who are referring to this, and, and uh, it's not because of that, simply that it's a matter of concern. So we've got this problem of uh, 
whether we're talking about France or Europe, uh, uh, taking a look at the types of subsidy that, that are being claimed and also the economic success, which is highly significant. It's very interesting to see uh, what's happening as regards the creative uh, industry and the impact on tourism, uh, territorial activities and development. Local mayors are delighted to have uh, local festivals. I mean, the mayor might be very keen on music or television or cinema or whatever, but uh, that's not the issue. They're aware of the economic uh, benefits at local level. So you have to remember that as well. I'll, I'll, in a little while, I'll go into uh, what we're thinking as regards to the future. But the effects of the crisis, we lost 30% uh, of our turnover in 2020. Things in 2021 are not quite that bad, but with the new lockdowns and the impact on uh, cinemas and concert halls and so on, uh, the, the public has been affected. The problem of uh, the pandemic was that it was an acceleration of what was happening anyhow, and it, it just got worse. One, one, one may or may not be worried about it, but you can start asking questions about the whether people are going to totally return to the cinemas. I mean, uh, VOD, for instance, uh, the offering there uh, has accelerated things. There are younger people who don't go to the cinema uh, as often as they do elsewhere. So that's fine. I mean, uh, publication, publishing uh, books, that seems to be doing doing better. It's very difficult, actually, to take stock of the results of the crisis. I mean, we'll have to, to, to step back from this and do this. We've got a thre threat for some 400,000 jobs in France and a lot more elsewhere in Europe. Public support in France, there's no denying it, has assisted us in different sectors. Uh, the Minister's already referred to the France Recovery 2050 plan, uh, but there's also France 2030, which is really quite remarkable. We're talking about 600 million that the CNC is going to be getting over the next few years to accompany authors and producers creators, nor will I say anything about the quality of the texts that have been passed at European level and that have been uh, translated into French law. There's just one regret I have, you're probably aware of this, and that is the weakness of the commitments by Netflix, uh, Amazon and uh, Disney in certain areas of audiovisual activity, particularly the documentaries. Let me say something also as regards information. Now, I know it's not precisely what you're talking about here, but uh, the DSA is dealing with this, uh, deals with this. In my organization, we've got a lot of uh, representatives uh, who are journalists, and I can tell you that it's a fundamental concern with fake news, uh, conspiracy theories, and so on. The fight against uh, conspiracy theories uh, means that we have to beef up the measures so that the major media and audiovisual companies have support as regards the news they're putting out. It's a real challenge in Europe and, and something that's been raised in the context of the DSA, but I really do think that it has to be brought to the very heart of public consideration. Uh, digital, well, it's an opportunity, there's no denying it, but there's a paradox in this as well, and that is that the digital develops a significant offering. Um, perhaps uh, too much choice kills choice. Even on Netflix, you tend to get lost in the massive choice that uh, is on offer. Uh, but we don't earn as much money with Netflix as we do with traditional offerings, uh, not just uh, in music, uh, but certainly there. The, the, the level of remuneration is far lower than in a more linear model. So we've got a real difficulty there, and that is the remuneration level in general terms of authors, creators, sometimes producers facing the digital challenge. And then there's the balance of power, uh, economic realities. If you've got hundreds of documentaries on uh, France television, you've got 10 or 15 only on Netflix. So, you know, you have to bear this in mind as well. The offering and the, the, the range of offering is, is very different. Uh, take a look at uh, uh, documentaries, uh, magazine programs on different channels. There's no comparison with uh, what you can get on digital channels. There's also podcasts, uh, uh, which affects the, the, the radio sector, uh, but there's no podcast economy there. So anyhow, we've got a great wealth of offerings, which has brought to an end one of the features of the cultural offering, which was this rareness factor, which impacts prices. And we've got a plethora on offer, but we've got a problem of funding, and we have to be aware of that. Uh, less fun finance remuneration. So, France Active has been uh, 
thinking about all of this. We've got a number of different strategies, and I'll go through this very quickly uh, so that I don't overshoot my speaking time. Uh, we've been thinking about the need to meet the societal challenges. Education, artistic education is not yet as it should be, and I could tell you something about uh, Russia, but it's perhaps not the time. Anyhow, in Russia, you've got uh, every afternoon, I think, uh, artist, artistic information is very powerful. That remains to be done in France. Media education, I was talking about uh, conspiracy theories, fake news, it's a total catastrophe in terms of citizenship. Uh, I think you're all aware of that, obviously, but we are, you have to take the bull by the horns. Uh, media education, that's a key to the future. Uh, uh, continuous training, apprenticeships, uh, authors, creators are getting to grips with that, but it's not yet been totally ironed out. So, the very heart of our action has to be in innovation, new technologies. What I'm struck by, I've been around for quite some time now, and I can say that in uh, about 20-odd years ago, uh, neither the FNAC nor Virgin Megastore managed to do what had to be done, in other words, to offer streaming. It was Netflix who came along and others. So in France, we really have to develop, and also in Europe, uh, thinking about uh, what can be done. Uh, I mean, it's really not okay that it's Netflix today that offers uh, a tremendous range of uh, European creations. I've never seen as many Danish, Spanish, Portuguese, Turkish series on a platform as you have on Netflix. But, you know, wh where is the European platform that we could have created? Uh, and, and this is really striking. It's very worrying. Uh, we have to be eco-responsible. That's to be done. It's already been mentioned by others. We have to be more efficient in terms of public action. We've got some uh, a huge network in, 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 in France, but it's not necessarily doing as it should. The uh, social and tax uh, context has to be adapted. There are all sorts of possibilities in France and Europe for movement and remuneration to be improved. Uh, the, so the, the employment... Uh, context uh, has to be ironed out to talk about a status of creator or auteur. I don't know whether you can say that a writer or someone who works uh, backstage in the theatre is necessarily uh, on a, uh, an equal footing. Anyhow, all of this has to be done and has to be done at European level. And then there are the economic levers. I think that the uh, objective uh, is 150,000 jobs between now and 2025, multiplying by 10 the number of startups in the sector giving thought also to uh, the uh, effects of AI and algorithms. It's not enough to have algorithms. You have to think about them, reconsider what can be done, not just have algorithms that uh, close you off in something that you can't escape from, because you might like something now, but you won't necessarily in the future. We've already seen that. We, as a result, we have a reduction of the offering. It's rather paradoxical because you get the impression that there's plenty on offer, but in fact, you're always coming back to the same thing. So thought has to go into that. There's also the need to support territory, local initiatives. There are tremendous resources that exist there. So we have to continue decentralizing things in France, including in the cultural domain. It's done in other countries, but I really think it's an important aspect, this uh, local approach to culture. Thank you. I know it was very fast. I did try to uh, cover uh, as much as I could looking to the future as to what we can do. Oh, we're in France. Uh, uh, things are looking not too bad in France. I mean, we tend to criticize ourselves, but if I take a look at what's happening in, in other countries, I can tell you that, particularly in the context of negotiations that I have with platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, we in France are ahead of the pack, and uh, that's pointed out to us uh, by our European friends, and, and they have to be able to catch up with us. And we need to see what's going on as regards YouTube. We're one of the few to have agreements. So things have to move. There's a lot that remains to be done. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Now we'll hear from France Television. Christophe Tardieu, he's there to represent Delphine Arnaud de Kunchi, who uh, has a, uh, an appointments clash. Everyone's aware of uh, yeah, courageous positions facing the rapid development of international platforms, uh, VOD. We know... Unfortunately, the sound quality from the speaker is rendering interpretation virtually impossible. Mr. Tardieu has the floor. 
Thank you. I hope that you can hear me. Obviously, we're all thinking about Ukraine today. And I'm thinking about also the journalists in situ working in very complicated circumstances. And they are there to try to uh, keep clear and reliable information coming through as regards what's happening in that country. Obviously, we're extremely worried about them and we're trying to support them. So, through the different things that have been mentioned this morning, uh, it leads me to say that what we have to do is uh, up the effort in order to pre preserve and protect the uh, creative industries. Public audiovisual services have a role to play as regards uh, uh, public service in Europe. We're there as a sort of economic strike force at local level. The first thing I'd like to say is there are a number of elements that could be mentioned that are highly topical. Classical television, I would say, continues to play a leading role in the lives of our citizens. French citizens, and I'm not talking about the current crisis, but the French citizens continue to uh, watch television a lot. Three and a quarter hours per day was the average figure last year. And uh, the figures have scarcely mo changed over the last few years. Mention has been made of platforms, but TV still today makes up some 75% of the screen time for the French. Public broadcasting, well, the French are particularly keen on maintaining this, and I can give you some figures as well. 85% feel that it's very important to have public channels. 71%, so 7 out of 10, have a good impression of uh, public TV channels. Most of the French see privatization as a, as a, a loss for diversity. It's also a risk and no longer being able to find free of charge, and that's the important thing, programs that are of interest to them. So yes, there are platforms. Yes, there's a huge alternative offer now. But we are proud to say that each week, eight citizens in te of 10 in France are watching public channels in France. Now, there are things that I'm not going to go over in detail because they've already been mentioned. Obviously, the sector is uh, fragile today in the context of the economic changes facing us all. And there's an additional feature, as far as we're concerned, that shouldn't be overlooked. Not only our resources have been dropping for several years, but we still don't know what's going to happen as regards uh, the uh, uh, citizen's contribution to the to the budget. Conclusions will be coming in May, um, but we're in the dark, and it's uh, extremely worrying. Let me also say something in response to a number of references made to the emergence of uh, digital players. Obviously, they, they are the most numerous in the field. But there's something that we don't mention all that much, but fortunately, the National Assembly has been dealing with it, and that's the he hegemony of connected TV. We're talking about smart TVs that are pre preponderant throughout the world, and the connected TV has now become the uh, preserve of American platforms. And the idea here is that uh, the platform is uh, integrated in such a way that they can uh, control the content. In other words, I think we're going to see a sort of remote control battle being waged. Classical channels, traditional channels are going to disappear. 
and you will have a remote control with a switch for Netflix, a switch for Amazon, others for Disney, and so on. because of uh, the arrangements that will be reached with the uh, manufacturers. So we're concerned that the local TV channels will fade into the background in the face of this challenge. Mention has been made of uh, what's been happening as regards the remote controls. It's really important that this matter be dealt with seriously so that the local players and the public TV channels are not pushed aside and becoming invisible on the remote control. If you take a look at the financial way with all of the platforms, there's a real threat there. Because there is this fear now that we, we might merge into the background. Uh, let me let me uh, voice some optimism, though. We've been talking a lot about the platforms, and quite rightly, we've been talking about this remarkable development with the uh, the AVMSD and so on, and the financial aspects. But don't forget that we're talking about 500 million euros per annum invested by French public TV into creation. Uh, now, in the U.S. We're talking about 300, roughly. And in the context of these investments, we're trying to develop in the context of the uh, European Union of Broadcasting, the EBU, uh, trying to come up with co-productions involving public TV channels. And, and there's an example I can think of. Uh, around the world in 80 days, for instance, a Franco-European production. It's a sort of example that demonstrates that we're still capable of producing quality works. And it is a real cultural added value. Let me say that in addition to those investments, France Television, it's not just a cost element. It's also a company that at national level creates value. It creates jobs and activity. Studies show that for one job with France Television, that gives us 5.1 additional jobs in the French economy. And because obviously we give an awful lot of work to production companies, to uh, technical uh, subcontractors and so on. So one euro produced in French television creates 2.4 euros in addition. And, and again, this demonstrates that our company is highly ambitious in terms of uh, its distribution capability in the French economy. I'd like to react to what Luc Besson was saying earlier on. It was extremely interesting. Uh, and we entirely agree with what he said. Yes, we need more possibilities for, her, for films to be shot in France. There's no denying that. And in the context of uh, recent plans developed uh, at state level, there's quite a lot of funding that's been earmarked for that. And we think it's really important that we say uh, to the uh, national and European representatives that we need more films to be made in our countries because it's thanks to this that we can continue to remain a major player. I should also like very quickly to go over the difficulties of training. It's very important to preserve our model because we have the feeling that in today's world, this could be a very important tool to fight against information fraud and use it in different ways. Three out of four French people feel like they trust French information. France Info is the platform that meets the most of these criteria, and this is very important. I think we see 
that this is a tool that we already have in hand, and it's very important to be able to have reliable, verified information when there is so much misinformation circulating in today's world, including some TV channels which are becoming propaganda networks without even talking about social networks, which have the capacity of spreading non-verified information, rumors, and conspiracy theories. There's a total difference between TV channels which are trying to do their work and social networks which are sending pretty much anything to pretty much anyone with the idea not of having reliable information which has been verified, but simply to have the greatest possible buzz and as many followers or likes as possible. So I would conclude with two final points that have also already been mentioned. I think by Katrin Maran de Sayi, there really is thought that has to happen on shared values. In the culture industry, it, this is something of fundamental importance. These values should not be captured by these big platforms, which today are competitors, might seem to be unfair competitors vis-a-vis -vis operators like ours. When you look at sports competitions, the people who are not interested in this even a few months ago are now starting to do so. And this could be a real threat for our channels. There's also talent capture, which is happening with exclusive contracts. There are a certain number of actors we're never going to see again in public or private audiovisual in France because they have Netflix contracts or others. And even worse, there are also authors who are going to have exclusive contracts of this nature. And this is a problem which is, of course, very important. And then one last point, and excuse me for having gone on at some length, I think we also need to think in the context of all these current developments about, about the fact that today a broadcaster has a real basic problem, which is that they broadcast images but don't build up assets. And I think our model could be compromised if we do not have actual assets in terms of the things we are broadcasting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I think we need to hear from our parliamentary partners, and I would suggest that we have a ping pong between people on the floor. We have 12 requests for the floor with four minutes of debate, and then we can have responses from the panel. So I would be grateful if you could limit your comments to something like three minutes per speaker. And I will lead my co-chair to carry out the rest of the exchange. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I will call for the first series of questions for three minutes each. I would ask you to take these four questions and then let the panel answer. And I'll ask Mr. Luc Besson to answer first so that he may make himself free since he was kind enough to be with us at a very late hour. So the first question will be asked by Eva Blininger president of the Culture Committee of the Bundestag for Austria. You have the floor, madam. Good morning to everyone. We're very pleased to be able to receive this information. I'll be doing this very quickly. I only have three minutes. It's already been said, I think. Things, very important measures need to be developed so as to strengthen public broadcasting. There are great dangers in particular with certain models of financing in Europe. We've lost the speaker, we're afraid. The connection was not very good. That's the situation in public law. And then I should also perhaps add something that hasn't been mentioned yet. We're also talking about digitalization of other media forms, particularly print media. That's already well underway. 
in the last decades, I think we have to see that we've had a massive reduction of the newspaper and magazine market. And what would interest me here is to know whether there are thoughts underway about how digitalization of this market will play itself out. In our parliament, we will have a law about digitalization, in particular of print media. But it's really just a drop of water on a hot stone, as we say. So my question would be to know what thoughts are underway in the European Union so as to deal with the print sector and make it stronger in this period of digitalization and also to have ins quality insurance for online media and to make that stronger. And then another thing that was mentioned many times are platforms. And here my question is to know whether there are any thoughts as to how we can move to an issue of uh, taxation such as we've seen with Google, Netflix, and so forth. I don't need to mention them all. The idea was to have a European platform basically as competition. And honestly, I have to say, I can't really see that. There are rather efforts being made, and this seems to me to be not very concrete, in fact. There's another issue as well in another area about protection of monuments, which in Europe are of very central importance. And my question here is to know whether there are initiatives or reflections about digitalization of monuments, to be able to call them up from data banks, to have European monuments dealt with by there are some individual initiatives underway in different countries. But I wonder if there are initiatives for financing this on a broader scale. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me give the floor to Georges Paulo Oliveira from the Portuguese National Assembly. Committee Chairman, uh, esteemed guest speakers, dear colleagues, as a small contribute about the help that uh, each member can state uh, can provide to the various culture industries, I would like to start by sharing that in Portugal, the sector that involves the culture and creative industry is comprised mainly by individuals and micro enterprises, very dependent of informal networks and with a business profile with low recognition by the banks, investors and governments, resulting sometimes in a devaluation in detriment of other activities considered more lucrative. In 2018, the culture Portuguese sector generates 5.3 billion euros and 3% of all the jobs. Although these may be low numbers, this is one of the sectors with the most qualification and economic potential. Resembling the rest of Europe, the pandemic in Portugal caused a very negative impact in this sector. At the end of 2020, the sector display losses higher than 70% when compared to 2019. In our opinion, its recuperation must be achieved using several instruments. Firstly, financing. The idea that the member state of the EU allocate 2% of the recovery plan funds to the sector is quite correct. Portugal, unfortunately, will not achieve such a goal. Next, by empowerment. And here it's critical that the governments approve protection measures for the artists and professionals. Portugal took effective steps in that direction and passed new laws. Finally, we must rush the digital transformation by putting more resources in online platforms, but at the same time, we must never forget that securing a fair payment system for the artists that create these products and service matters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me now give the floor to Mr. Vasmeros from 
the culture committee in the from Greece in Greece. Monsieur Digalakis. Mr. Digalakis. Voilà. Vous connectez. Yeah. Hello. Merci. Okay, thank you. Dear fellows, uh, let me first start by expressing our solidarity to the Ukrainian people. Greece is uh, fully supporting all measures taken and actually is already sending uh, humanitarian as well as defensive ma material to U Ukraine uh, to support their cause. Uh, I would like to focus on Greece's measures and reforms to support cultural industry, to protect IP rights and support the audiovisual sector. Cultural and creative sector professionals were oftentimes in a precarious situation already, self-employed, freelancers, uh, <coughs> irregular contracts, fragility of a labor market, increasingly saved by the growing gig economy, zero-hour contracts. The situation uh, got aggravated by the Greek debt crisis in Greece. Between 2012 and 2019, 18,000 self-employed cultural professionals closed their books. The pandemic left many of those artists, artists without any source of income. For this reason, the Greek government proceeded with a series of short-term measures to support the sector, while also developing at the same time a long-term strategy. Short-term measures included a half a billion support package to the cultural and creative sector, as well as the setup of a cultural professionals registry in order to support artists. Employment practices in the sector and more, most prominently undeclared work were the main reason why individuals employed in the sector did not have access to the safety net provided by the state in case of unemployment or other external shocks, such as the pandemic crisis. However, this registry is a temporary solution. Long-term planning uh, is also develop being developed. For this reason, the Greek Ministry of Culture secured funding through the EU's Resilience and Recovery Fund to reform the employment and social security system of the cultural sector in Greece. In total, over half a billion euros is earmarked for the cultural sector in the Greek RRF program. The objective of the reform is to introduce measures and incentives that will increase the real work, support and protect the industry's professionals. Now concerning IP rights, the Greek government uh, during the last two years passed three IP related bills within six months, introducing the dynamic block blocking injunction as well as the live blocking injunction legal system. At the same time, Greece seeks to, in, seeks to reinforce its mechanisms to combat private piracy and upgrade the infrastructure and technological capabilities of its anti-piracy enforcement mechanism through, again, an RRF program. Concerning the audiovisual sector, and I will close with this, we have been taking measures to strengthen the sector as well as collaboration with other European countries in this field. Ratification of the revised Council of Europe Convention on Cinematographic Production, securement of RRF funds, especially for the audiovisual sector, support of audiovisual entrepreneurship, creation of a new national film school, rebate incentives, and an extensive effort to protect intellectual, intellectual property. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me call on our Cypriot colleague, Mr. Kyriakos Aginyanim, who is the president of the Committee for Energy, Commerce and Industry and Tourism, who would like to speak for three minutes. I want to express also my solidarity, our solidarity to the people in Ukraine. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, intensively accelerated the use of uh, digital technologies in the country. <laughs> ...to publish and share content 
with minimal or no cost have created options on how artists establish new networks and methods that enable them to find new audiences and col collaborators. They have generated new products and have opened significant new markets. Moreover, they created unique opportunities for preserving intangible cultural heritage through achieving information. However, all these opportunities bear challenges. Many businesses struggle to adjust to the new environment because they lack the infrastructure, funds, time, staff, or technical resources. Many people do not have digital skills, tool, uh, tools, or access to the internet. There are also risks related to data, namely the misuse of data by artificial intelligence, personal data leakage, sensor, ownership, and protection of copyright issues, etc. Adequate national legislation and policies adopted and implemented to promote the benefits of digital cultural streets and tackle these challenges are necessary. Artists and cultural organizations must be supported through funding programs, training, and technological tools that will assist in the transition to the era, allowing the new markets to become sustainable. Cyprus' uh, National Digital Strategy 2025 relies on achieving four strategies of objectives. Technology that works for all, a vibrant, sustainable, and resilient digital economy, an open, democratic, and inclusive digital society, and a green digital transition. The Deputy Minister of Research, Innovation, and Digital Policy has issued a national plan for digital ability 21-25 with a vision to create a digitally mature society throughout a holistic spectrum of business and the social fabric. Other actions aim at promoting the cultural sector, include digitizing the museums of Cyprus started in 21, and participation of Cyprus in the Expo in 2020 in Dubai, where a hologram of the goddess Aphrodite welcomes visitors to the Cypriot pavilion, taking them in a journey through the island's history. Special emphasis has been placed on enriching the visitors' experiences through various lenses and digital multimedia, making the most of the ability offered by technology. Cultural and creative industries are fundamental to support sustainable development or, or and also growth as culture shapes our identity, diversity, and generation. Freely accessing and requesting cultural data from various areas can contribute not only to preservation of cultural heritage, but also to its expansion through creativity and innovation as provided by the digital space. Thank you very much and congratulate for this excellent uh, uh, meeting. Thank you so much for that contribution, dear colleague. So now let me give the floor to Mr. Celso Luis Delgado, who represents Spain. Please excuse me if I have got your name wrong for three minutes. Buenos días. Yes, hello. From the Congress of Spain, I'd like to thank the French National Assembly and the French Senate for organizing this conference and express our full solidarity with the Ukrainian people. I'd like to say that in Spain we consider that the future of the cultural industry and the digital sector in Europe is a source of hope, and for this reason we need to work together in Europe and intensely so as to achieve that goal. We understand that these industries are going to play a strategic role for economic growth in years to come and will make a contribution to 
decent work and high quality production. And this form of development and progress will require us to position ourselves in the digital economy when to see the effects that are induced in other sectors as well. We need to promote in Europe investments necessary for the creation and broadcasting of digital and cultural products and services which will increase the supply that is available in these fields. And we also think that we need to improve access of citizens to these media and to these products. And for this reason, we need to stimulate the participation of the private sector and the financing of projects in the cultural sector. In Spain, we are working to give new impetus to training and industrializations in the creative and cultural sectors because we want Spain within Europe to be a cultural power with application of all new technologies. And therefore, we're working with the different cultural and creative industries in the digital context, in particular in audiovisual areas and architecture and different forms of um, creative arts, television medias, books, music, dance, fashion, cultural heritage, cultural tourism, and of course, videos. And I will conclude on these words. Our council of ministers yesterday in Spain approved a strategic project for recovery in a European framework and which is called New Economy of the Language, which goal is to mobilize public and private investments to maximize the value of the Spanish language and the languages of the state in a process of overall transformation. Let us remember the Spanish language is spoken by 600 million citizens throughout the world, and a considerable percentage of production is in Spanish. After English and French, it is one of the principal languages concerned, and it's also one of the languages most used in internet. The use by cultural industries in Spanish language will further strengthen our position as a cultural bridge between the European Union and Latin America. So the point of this draft law is to guarantee that including with uh, international and uh, with artificial intelligence that Spanish firms and Spanish individuals will go on playing an important role. Europe has got to be part of this diversity. We all have to have a role to play because if anything defines Europe over and above our defense and respect of values of human rights, it is our diversity and our cultural wealth. Thank you. Merci, cher collègue. Vous avez bien raison. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleague. And indeed, multilingualism, very important, very important at the core of Europe's values. Now I would like uh, to hand over to Daniel Milowski from Poland, the last uh, speaker. Um, digital sharing of cultural resources and cultural heritage prevents losses while providing future generations with access to priceless cultural goods and insp inspiring uh, knowledge about them. Um, the, strate the strategic uh, goal of the Polish governmental program of digital culture implemented since uh, 2016 is to make available and enable to reuse of digital resources for popularization, education and scientific purposes, including the development and digitalization of cultural uh, heritage resources. The program supports acti activities which aim at uh, di di digitalizing cultural resources, taking into uh, account modern forms of the representation using inter alia, 3D, VR, AR techniques, etc. Uh, these technologies uh, allow not only the digital presentation of physical physical monuments, but also reconstruction of uh, those that uh, could not survive or, or uh, and the only records about them are available only in written sources. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're going to now allow panel members to reply, starting with Mr. Luc Besson. For a total of two minutes uh, before we uh, come back 
to our debate. C'est bon, vous pouvez y aller. Please go ahead, sir. I do apologize, uh, and uh, I'm afraid I did not get translation, uh, in particular from Spanish, so I did not hear if there was a specific question addressed to me, and therefore I do, know, do not know how to respond. Well, don't worry about that. Thank you for staying up very late. We can give uh, the floor now to other members of the panel, but thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I know that the technical side of things can make it difficult to reply. Are there any other members of the panel who wish to respond? Ms. Hoffman, Mr. Fontaine, Mr. Aruni, who is here with us. Merci, Monsieur Besson. Thank you very much, Mr. Besson. I should be the one thanking you. Thank you very much. En fait, je je voulais un peu par rapport à ce qui a été dit par certains. Mr. Roni, yes, I would like to come back on something that was not mentioned, but I, I think is very important as well. And I'm saying this because Christophe Tardieu is amongst us. That is the joint regulatory work done by ERCA that brings together different regulatory authorities. I think that that can be a powerful means in Europe to regulate issues relating to investing in culture, uh, regulating television sh channels activities. In France, our regulatory authority has extended powers over different areas like regulating news uh, channels and dissemination, etc. So uh, we're looking at the liminal areas on the outer bounds of the cultural industry. Now, Spain mentioned multilingualism. I think there are two sides to this coin in Europe. Indeed, we do need to work on having a united Europe where there is freedom of circulation uh, of works, for example. And I was saying earlier that there was a paradox in having a huge American platform like a Netflix uh, thanks to which we've never had so much access to multilingual European content. So perhaps we should look more into this European paradox, a political paradox. Where we are all striving to defend our languages, our own languages, our own cultures, not to mention our regional quirks and idiosyncrasies. So defending a national culture, uh, but isn't, isn't there interferences? Isn't there a paradox with wanting to have open borders? But by opening up our borders, we have uh, uh, left ourselves open to this onslaught by mm, North American productions. Uh, we have been thinking about this for many years and debating about this for many years, so allowing free circulation of works, but also not uh, or continuing to give ourselves the means to uh, um, defend our uh, national uh, works. There is this paradox in what we're all trying to do. You know, a strawberry-flavored yogurt will, will, uh, is easier to distribute across Europe. Everybody uh, eats uh, the same strawberry-flavored uh, Europe across uh, Europe. Well, perhaps the Swedes have slightly different tastes to the Spaniards, but 
I know what I mean, at least, and I hope I'm coming across clearly, but... I'm not necessarily defending the uh, emergence of uh, big European corporations, but we de do need something in Europe that will be able to contend with the huge American operators. Consolidation of public service. Why not? If this helps uh, to defend European works. Oui, vous avez raison. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to know if there are other contributions by other panelists. Mr. Tardieu, would you like to respond to some of the observations made by uh, the MPs? Yes, thank you very much, but quickly, because I don't want to monopolize the floor. There is one, I think, very interesting point, which perhaps was not mentioned yet this morning. And that is the future Media Freedom Act, something that was proposed by Commissioner Jourova and Vice President Thierry Breton. There is a public consultation underway, and it states that public service media, that they may be subject to political interference, and this may call into question their special treatment in terms of uh, public subsidy. Now, that consultation is a very technical one, uh, but what the statement does show is that the European Union, the European Commission, is concerned with allowing the media to uh, conduct their operations in total freedom and without interference, uh, uh, despite the public money that they receive. So we have allowed the media, some media, to develop uh, uh, without any kind of oversight or regulation. Uh, Mr. Roni is absolutely right to mention the role of the uh, ERGA, ERGA, and now we have the ACOM in France. Sometimes, you know, they call us to order, but that's part of uh, the rules of the game. I think that in having independent administrative authorities overseeing the whole thing, I think is very important. And so we are glad to see our comms remit having been broadened to include the internet, because it was really the Wild West out there for a while. So this concern expressed by the European Commission, and we'll see what uh, uh, becomes of the Media Freedom Act uh, proposal in the next few months, uh, is something very important. We are living in very complex times, and allowing media, the media, to uh, operate freely without any kind of pressure from political authorities is a very precious dimension of our democracies. I think that uh, some of our previous speakers mentioned that uh, for us it's a core value, it's part of our DNA. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Mr. Besson um, to uh, speak, I think he's requested the ability to say uh, to say something to us. If he can reconnect. Monsieur Besson. M'entendez? Oui, très bien. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Très bien, merci. Voilà. I hope you can hear me. I would just like to come back to the idea of uh, a much-needed European platform. When we look at, Europe, at American platforms, although I have the utmost respect for the American creative industry, they are after total hegemony. They do want to sell their products all over the world, and that would be to the detriment of our own uh, creative productions. In the 60s, American studios, all American studios invested in Italy, and they started to produce uh, American, um, Italian uh, works. They didn't back the best uh, filmmakers, but 
in backing Italian filmmakers, they squeezed out Italian production and they uh, completely raised to the ground uh, any uh, Italian production industry. So don't get them wrong, when they come to France to produce uh, uh, French TV series or films, they're not out there to produce quality. So uh, it's not our best artists uh, or creative artists that work with them. They produce what they what is convenient to them. They want their products, their culture to take pride of place. And I think you have to really keep your eyes wide open. This is not just an ideological struggle. It's an actual battle. We are losing, we will lose our European identity if we do not fight back massively. We need to be able, we need to have the wherewithal to sell who we are, what we produce, and that requires a platform. It is vital. Let's take the example of uh, how French film is funded. The financing system was set up after the Second World War, and it allowed us to uh, stay strong for a long time. We had a good national production for many, many years, but with digital technology uh, and people uh, finding content on uh, platforms, all of this has changed, and uh, things are completely out of our control now. Producers, uh, uh, technicians, pro uh, filmmakers, actors, are out to get strangled by these platforms. We are out to become only subcontractors. I really, really can't stress this enough. I'm out here in the field every day. Uh, sometimes we see lists of uh, 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 authorized or certified uh, uh, people working with platforms. You have to uh, accept their terms. If you don't, then you're blacklisted. You never work with them again. And that certainly is not beneficial to artistic creation. So a powerful European platform is really vital. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Fontaine before we close this session. Thank you very much. Now, I was able to get uh, the translation, but I don't believe that there were any specific questions for me, so I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so that's the end of this debate, and I will hand over to uh, our moderator, Mr. Studer. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone for taking part in this debate. Just quickly, I think that we need, uh, all we can say is that we need a stronger union, stronger European Union to defend our cultural industries, uh, to make sure that our audiovisual and cultural industries uh, are strong in the 21st century. I thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to seeing some of you again for the part of our debate devoted to space this afternoon. I would like to hand over to Ms. Laetitia Saint-Paul for the French National Assembly for her concluding remarks. Dear colleagues, dear panelists, uh, thank you very much for your presence today. Film provides us with an uh, outlet for our emotions. Uh, I'm an MP, uh, uh, but I was a child. And it's a, it was a great honor today to meet, although virtually, uh, Mr. Uh, Luc Besson, because I enjoyed his movies, still enjoy his movies. Culture is really something that, that can bring us together, that overcomes any kinds of barriers and boundaries and uh, uh, borders. I was very happy to engage in such a lively debate today. Now, we are uh, uh, 
going to be looking at a very different dimension this afternoon, but quite complementary. We will be dealing with uh, the space sector this afternoon, and we hope that you will be there with us. Thank you. La science est en close. Vous pouvez... You may now disconnect from Zoom and join us again this afternoon if you wish. Thank you.